Hello folks, uh, Simon here. Uh, we are into a theory session now, uh, which is to do with scales and key signatures. Uh, apologies, I'm going to yawn. Um, hopefully you're enjoying the weekend so far. Um, so this uh, session is again uh, a recorded session from uh, end of July, beginning of August 2020, uh, which takes you through all the information you need to know about scales, key signatures, information about them, about sound as well, how sound works, scales, key signatures, how to work out key signatures and all that kind of stuff and hopefully demystifying a few things uh, about music theory. So uh, if you've seen the session before, get yourself a cup of coffee. Uh, and go off and do something else with your time if not hopefully you enjoy it's about an hour and 35 minutes I think it is the session itself so you can have a little look at this and just go through the information that's there uh, you've got access to the links to the PowerPoint presentation and any of the other information and learning resources you need for that so do feel free to go through that uh, it is a recorded session already so it looks like there's people in there but they're not actually live so you're not missing out on a live session at the moment it was something that was recorded uh, just over a year ago, but we thought it would be a, a useful thing to put into the weekend. So uh, thank you very much, folks. Hope you're enjoying yourselves, and I'll see you soon. doot de doot Just press record, uh, and we're going to get a go. Can you all see my screen, folks? I shared it at the beginning so I could get all my stuff set up on my secondary screen and my main screen there with the PowerPoint presentation. So uh, I would just like to see that there is a video background as we go into the unknown. Um, I'm just going to point that out that it's a background and it's 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 good. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm just going to admit Hazel, she's asked to come in. So first and foremost, we're going to start and then we're going to go backwards. So first and foremost, what is a scale? Again, wow. definitions are useful, but only to a point. So any set of musical notes ordered by fundamental frequency or pitch is a scale. Okay, not particularly useful. It's quite generic uh, as a definition. Basically, it's any set of musical notes is a scale. But we know if we know a little bit about a scale, that's not what we mean when we say a scale. Okay. Um, uh, again, what is a scale? It's where most or all of the melody and harmony of a musical work is built using the notes of a single scale which can be conveniently represented on a staff or a stave with a standard key signature. Well, that's very useful, apart from what if you don't know what a key signature is, that doesn't help with the definition. Any definition which requires you to understand a different thing that needs its own definition can be less useful. There's words in there that we may well not necessarily 100% um, understand. Melody, harmony, scales, staffs, key signatures. Okay, so there's other words there. So there is no perfect definition of any of often these kind of musical things. Again, what is a scale? A musical scale represents a division of the octave space into a certain number of scale steps. A scale step being the recognizable distance or interval between two successive notes of the scale. It's interesting to use a definition for what a scale is by using the word scale. Um, so again, a definition that features the word you're trying to define is sometimes not overly useful either. Um, but again, so th there are some definitions about what a scale is. So therefore, we, I've just kind of picked up on a few of the bits here of like to help us understand this. This is just where we go backwards into the land of physics. What is a sound wave? That's where we're going to start off. What is sound? Okay, I'm going to be brief on this. And again, this is a hopefully understandable way of putting this out. Sound is measured in hertz or cycles per second. So that's the first thing. It's measured. Sound is measured. It's a frequency. Musical and non-musical um, sounds all have a frequency. They, they have their hertz, their cycles per second. Okay? In fact, most sounds have multiple frequencies going off at the same time. So, for example, if I was to um, drop a brick on the floor, it would have a sound. That would not just make one sound. It wouldn't be a pure frequency. There would be lots of different frequencies, and that is what makes the non-musical sound of, a, of like a brick hitting the floor. If I dropped a brick on the floor, you wouldn't go, ooh, that was a middle C. It, it, that's, yeah, <laughs> it is a non-musical sound, okay? Um, when we talk about musical sounds, it's when we are generally trying to put out one specific frequency or the perception of one frequency, and we hear it as a 
as a musical note because we're focusing around a specific frequency as opposed to a sound that is basically across the frequency spectrum. Okay? A sound wave is made up, and this is, again, by compression and rarefraction. Okay? Now, I will explain what that is. This, this tuning fork slightly shows this. If you hit a tuning fork, the, the tines of the tuning fork vibrate. As those tines vibrate, and this is just a little gif, but it, was, it, it served a purpose, what happens is the particle, it compresses the particles in the air. As that part of the tuning fork moves, it compresses part of the particles in the air, and that therefore um, sends those particles of air moving. Okay? And each time that, that tuning fork goes the opposite direction, because vibration happens longitudinally, it goes one way and another, okay? it therefore creates low pressure. So you basically get little pockets of high pressure. High pressure, which is compression, and low pressure areas called, which is rarefractions. Now, if I just go through this, and I'll go through this, and then we can ask some questions if there's anything that's not sticking. Um, but again, that, that picture shows it. When that tuning fork therefore moves, it basically squishes some of the air together, and therefore you've got high pressure and low pressure. Now, the high pressure areas here, and if you can see here, can you see my mouth, by the way, wiggle waggling on the screen? Excellent, that's cool. So the compressions are where the particles are closer together. And that's been caused by the vibration of that tuning fork, or the vibration of our voice, or the vibration of our brick falling on the floor. Okay? The rare fractions are where, the, where that tuning fork has gone the opposite direction and caused there to be low pressure. Okay? There's still the same number of particles in that amount of space, but they're, they're into high and, low frequency, uh, high and low pressure waves within that frequency. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. um, and the picture hopefully gives you an idea. And that is therefore a sound wave. Now, we mostly display sound waves like a sine wave. So the uppy-downy thing that we see here. That's how we often see sound represented. Okay? If you ever see like a sound generator or tone generator, you will see the uppy and downy. Yeah? Now, it's very useful to see sound that way, but we do need to be careful not to confuse the actual way sound works, which is the top picture, okay, um, with the fact that sound, wa sound waves don't go up and down in real life. Like, when I speak, the sound doesn't go up in the air and then go down in the air and then go up in the air and then go down in the air. It is just a way we illustrate that to be understandable. Does that make sense? So sound waves don't go up and down. They're not wibbly wobbly, okay? They don't wibbly wobbly like a wave. We draw them as a wave because we want you to people to understand what they are. And actually a wave kind of shows you where the wave goes up, that shows the compression. As the wave goes down, that shows the rarefraction, okay? But it's, it's a different visual way because the, this way here is a relatively... Um, it's a correct way of um, showing it, but it's not very useful if we're looking at it in combination with other frequencies. Yeah? Does that make sense? So yeah. just don't think, I don't want you going away thinking that sound, if we were to be able to see it, it would be like an uppy downy roller coaster thing that goes up and down through the air. It doesn't. Okay? And also, although sound goes in one direction, we know sound goes in th th three dimensionally. It goes outwards. So if you were to think it's like a three dimensional pebble falling in a three dimensional pond. If you imagine a pebble, if I drop a pedal in the middle of a pond, ripples go outwards, but they only go out one direction. Sound, if you imagine dropping a pedal, pebble, it goes through hundred, all the way around, three dimensionally. So it goes outwards in all directions. Obviously there is direction of my sound, but if I talk one direction and you're standing behind me, you can still hear that. If I'm, in a, if I'm in an open space, obviously you can hear less of that because the sound is going more in one direction, but there is still, you know, the sound out of my mouth does go from lots of direction outwards, okay? It's why microphones work the way they do, is that microphones will pick up from a certain direction. Some microphones will pick up everything around you, omnidirectional. Some microphones will be more unidirectional and pick up from one direction. Okay, so sound isn't just like a laser beam. We sometimes tell singers to sing like a laser beam and put it in one direction. That doesn't actually affect how the sound comes out of your mouth. Okay, 
So if I stand to the side of you, I can still hear you, even if you're trying to laser beam. It's not like you send a torch light and if I'm not in front of the torch, I can't hear anything because we know that's not the case. Okay, so sound does have a three a three dimensional aspect to it. Um, now, what happens when it hits your ear? Okay, and I'm going through this quickly, but just wanted to make sure you got this. When sound waves hit your eardrum, it initially makes your eardrum compress. Now that is not what your eardrum looks like. Your eardrum is not blue. Okay, as far as I'm aware, though I've never seen one. Maybe it is. Um, when the sound wave hits your eardrum, okay, it basically makes that it basically makes that eardrum go inwards with that pressure okay when the rare refraction's there it basically then pulls that eardrum back out again and so as those high pressure hit your eardrum that therefore vibrates in the same frequency that the tuning fork did okay so the energy from the tuning fork goes ding it travels with those high those high and low pressure sound waves the compression the rare refraction to your eardrum then picks that up vibrates the same amount of times per second and your brain converts that into a musical sound okay so your brain has to take that analog signal and convert it into a digital signal into your brain to understand what that sound sounds like okay so we might think of it as a, as a, as a musical note um that's how we perceive it okay so that's basically how it works um the number of times Though that high pressure wave hits your ear is the frequency measured in times it hits you per second. So if I was to give you a note and you were to get a, that was to happen a hundred times a second, we would hear that hundred times a second movement and it gets converted into a sound. Okay, we convert that in our brain, converts those those vibrations per second, cycles per second. We we measure them in hertz because the man who I think who discovered this and, and, and found upon this science is named after him, Hertz. Um, that's what we call it as. So first and foremost, everything we're talking about is frequency, is frequency and we are measuring it in Hertz and that's generally how sound works. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea. It doesn't matter if you a little bit scratch your head at that point, but I did want to cover that because the next bit we go through, I'm going to refer back to frequency. And if we don't understand what frequency and sound waves are, we're not going to really understand the next bit either. Are there, at this point, are there any questions on any of that or anything you want me to re-go through? Lynn W. Can I just ask if you can make the link between sound waves and frequency with those um, weird digital audio vi video tracks that you produce for the sound, each part? Um, you with the line moving across with the light, yeah, kind of, kind of. Um, the high frequency. Um, so imagine I'll I'll give the pebble analogy again. Although you have to imagine it's a three dimensional pond. Okay, goes in all directions. If I drop a little pebble in a pond, that little pebble will create lots of little waves. Those waves will be closer together. Does that make sense? Little, so uh, and then imagine that little pebble is a high frequency sound. High frequency, little pebble in pond, lots of li little waves. Doesn't mean they've got less energy, by the way. So I know in a little pebble in a pond, it would have less energy. High frequency don't actually have less energy. They have the same amount of energy, uh, but sometimes we don't hear them as well. High frequencies, low frequencies travel further. Uh, and I won't get into the, the science of that either. Imagine a big rock going in. That would form big waves okay that would be a lower frequency so basically they might be like you know they they hit they are bigger waves and they therefore are lower because that rock is lower it's not a perfect analogy that one because the whole point of if you drop a large rock in a pond it obviously has more energy and the waves are not only longer they're actually more powerful and they're bigger sound again is not quite like that you can have a really powerful high frequency and a really weak low frequency okay uh and again i'm not going to go too much into volume volume is measured in decibels um and again that's how loud something is 
but it's going to get confusing if I go into that right now. But yeah, so basically you can see sound waves on, on, on my Cubase thing. Sometimes if you're in the background, you see you can see basically how loud something is. It doesn't really give you a, a very good sense until you zoom really into that sound wave that it then does. You can see the waves go up and down and the how high they go up is the volume. Okay, is is basically how loud that thing is. So if it's if they're only going up and down a little bit, that's quiet. If they're up and down a lot, that's loud. The distance between them is the frequency. So if those if they're really really close together, that's high frequency. If the actual if the actual curves are a lot shallower, that is low frequency. So you can kind of look at those sound waves I use on Cubase in my videos and kind of get an idea. Uh, but sometimes you have to really zoom into these things to see the representation of the waves, knowing that sound isn't actually a wave. It's compression rarefaction. So that's... I, had a question, I had a question about the eardrums. Yes, Susan. OK, I'm sorry. I didn't know how to raise my hand on Zoom, so I just yelled. Oh, that's fine. No worries. <laughs> I'm sorry. OK, so when the sound waves when it when the frequency is out of our range of perception yeah okay so are our eardrums still going in and out and our brain is not perceiving it or where's the breakdown or is it that our eardrums are not doing this well again i would say uh, and i'll liken this to a speaker if some speakers are very good at picking uh, about, about reproducing um low sound so if you think of like of a like a subwoofer that's like a big speaker and it's very good at reproducing low sound and you think the little the little ones that are often made of metal on a speaker are called the tweeters they're very good at doing high frequency sound now your ear uh, is very good at both of those as we get older and i'm not a medical practitioner as we get older often our eardrum will become less flexible and less efficient and actually it won't pick up those frequencies as well does okay. that make sense so actually yeah. it will lose it'll be basically it's a bit old and if you ever think of an old speaker if you ever plugged an old speaker and you turn the volume up it starts distorting and it starts basically making a funny noise and it isn't accurately or you go into a supermarket and their speaker's a bit old and knackered and it that, that as soon as the the certain and oh you'll notice certain frequencies on speakers is when they go wrong and they'll make a funny buzzing noise at a certain frequency um um so yeah uh, one second sorry i'll just yeah someone said when they're doing questions you should take my screen down so hopefully you can see me so yeah so um that is how your ears will slightly work as well you might sometimes your ears won't be good at picking up a, a certain frequency yeah. when you're younger those high frequencies you can definitely pick up 19 kilohertz 20 kilohertz the older you get your ears get less and less able to hear those high frequencies yes denise yeah, that reminds me of a fun test that I saw in an app that was doing that with certain frequencies. Yeah. And my sons could hear the tone. I'm going like, you're playing with me. You you hear that? I can't yeah. hear it. I, yeah. I thought it was so strange. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, and again, there is, and that's why some of those, um, um, in some countries, they use high frequency generators to stop young people congregating in certain areas. So they'll have a tone generator, which basically sends out a high pitched 19 kilohertz, which only people like under the age of 21 can hear. And this is actually true uh, because it's uncomfortable for them to stand near it. But most of us can't even hear it. So I wouldn't be able to hear it. So I'd walk past there. I wouldn't even hear it. Someone who's maybe 15, 16 would walk past there and it would be like, oh, what's that? And actually, it's used as a as a deterrent for congregating in in certain areas. Uh, so yeah, as we get older, our, our the high frequency, especially, but also low frequency ability to hear those things uh, does change. And I think, as far as I'm aware, that's as the eardrum gets less elasticity and is less able to pick up those vibrations um, as you get older. Uh, Tim B. Yeah. So it's not just the drum, is it, Sam? It's it's, it's the way the ear digitizes the signal uh, into an electrical pulse with the is it the hammer and the anvil the little bones yeah, the hammer and the anvil yeah yeah they also get much more worn and less sensitive which is again why you lose the higher pitch the yeah. higher frequencies yeah. yeah. So, yeah, when I say eardrum, obviously the entire the entire mechanism of the, the eardrum, the the basically the way it turns the physical, the physical power of that audio signal and it turns it into vibration to then digital signal, which then goes into your brain. 
all of that basically slightly becomes slightly less efficient and works slightly less well. So we can't hear as well. Um, but yeah, so again, like I said, I am uh, I'm okay on quite a lot of that information, but uh, I, I've never seen the inner parts of the ear, apart from knowing that my own ear has probably got too much wax in it, which is why I sing too loud. Um, now, um, just moving on from there. Um, oh, I'll just share my screen again. So that takes us on to uh, the next question, because for me, the questions are important to therefore try and understand stuff. The next question is, what is an octave? Now, we may well think that we know what an octave is, and an octave is an awful name for it, by the way. The octave is big, basically people who invented their heptatonic scale, where you've got seven notes of a scale and the eighth is the octave. It shouldn't be called the octave. If we were to rename it, we'd call it something different that makes sense for other styles of music that don't use a seven-note uh, scale system. But nonetheless, um, our ear perceives certain frequencies as being similar based upon their relationship to one another. Okay, uh, This happens when one note has either half or twice the frequency as the original note. Okay, and we'll go through some examples of this. The new note sounds like a higher or lower version of that first note. Okay? To go through on that, and I'll, this is like and this is where I know this is where it's it's an imprecise way, but again, at least we can see and understand what we mean here. An, an A, the note A above middle C, has a frequency of 440 hertz. That means the sound wave hits your eardrum 440 times a second. Our brain hears that as an A. If we listen to a frequency exactly half of that, so 220 hertz, we hear that as the same note. We hear it as an A, but it sounds like a lower version of the same note. This is, in, this is in nature. This is nothing that anybody invented, okay? Like, nobody invented this. This is just like, this is, we, we listen to this, and those notes to our brains sound the same, but they're like a higher and a lower version of one another. If we halve that frequency again, 110 hertz, that sounds like an A, an octave lower. If we were to do a note of 880 hertz, doubling it, we would sound an A, an octave higher. Okay, so first and foremost, the octave, as we see there, this is, imagine that this, this is basically like a guitar string, okay? Basically, this is a guitar string that is fastened at either end, okay? And that's like basically the, the, the vibration that it goes up and down. If that was what the vibration looked like, that's 110 hertz. 220, the, the high pressure and the low pressure, kind of, they, they map together. So two waves fit in exactly the space of one and therefore that is why they sound the same because the frequency is is <coughs> twice as much for 440 four waves fit into the space of one or into the space of two so it sound they sound similar because really there is a direct mathematical relationship between the sound pressure hitting your eardrum okay that's why octaves sound like octaves and we can pick that out we can pick out an octave uh, and they exist in nature, so we heard the we'll have heard them from again some of the earliest types of music um, were what's called diatonic, so potentially would have been mimicking of those sounds of nature, potentially two note scales, so potentially that note there and then the octave above, and that will have been some of the earliest form of music which have been vocalizations of that there, an octave above, an octave down, so they'd only really been very little movement between those okay um, obviously it's very difficult to know exactly that's the case because we haven't got historical records of what that music sounded like of our uh, distant distant ancestors okay but these things exist in nature okay so we haven't invented this this is just we perceive these things and we replicate those noises okay um if therefore now this is where this is where don't worry about this i'm not an expert on this but I'll just explain. If we take, and if I just go backwards slightly, if we imagine we've split this string here and like this frequency, we've doubled the frequency to 110 to 220, and we've doubled it again to 440. What happens if we triple it? As in, we fit three into one. It's to 880. Okay. 
So no, not no, no. I, uh, from from the one, if we go from one to three, so we had 110 hertz, 220, and then we do 330. It's going to be a note between an A and another A an octave higher. Does that make sense? So if I was to say, okay, well, what happens if I if I go 110, 220, 330? Now it's not an A because an A is 220 and the next A is 440, and it's in the middle. It's kind of in between the two, yeah. And this is another natural pitch, okay? And this is when you get into what's called the harmonic overtone series, okay? And I'm not going to spend huge amounts of time on this, but a lot of the notes that exist in our scale system or in our, actually, when we sing barbershop, they exist more so than in other types of Western music. So, for example, the note we would call a fifth is based upon, the fifth is based upon that three times multiplier. Okay, so actually, 330 hertz in between two, uh, 220 and 440 would to us sound like a fifth. It would sound like five notes up from that original A. Okay, that's where we derive the note of a fifth because it's a natural overtone. I'm going to play you a video which you may have heard in, uh, in a minute, um, but the fifth comes from there. As we keep on take, taking these multipliers, and you'll see that there, if you looked upon that, 65 hertz, then to 130 to 260, you've got the doubling effect here from 260 to 520. But if you're if you're if you're going one times, two times, three times your original frequency, you get all these what's called harmonics, and these exist in nature. So you get your fifth, you get a major third, you get fifths, you get major seconds. It says here, and this is an interesting one, the sixth harmonic is a minor seventh higher, though it will be slightly out of tune, possibly unless you sing Barbershop. Uh, but I'm not going to go into too much detail. If you look into overtones, Barbershop is really into overtones. And there's a great, um, there's some great um, presentations. I was wondered in Harmony College last year by the uh, current British quartet champs called Sound Hypothesis, which was explaining overtones and why we sing in a different tuning system to standard. Because these overtones are, they stack up better. We sing properly and we tune ourselves based on what sounds right, not based on what the piano does. But again... All of this is a little bit too much info, so I'm not going to go into, uh, into detail, but just know that there's quite a lot of... The, the notes that we use are initially based upon nature, okay? So initially, the notes of our Western scales are an attempt, a note that I say an attempt, to recreate the fundamental relationship between those frequencies, the doubling, the tripling of fundamental frequencies and those natural harmonic overtones which exist within nature. Again, not the biggest expert on this, just presenting it so you kind of get a bit of a background info. There's loads of very intelligent people with lots of big degrees uh, who will have lots more information and can explain it really, really well. However, through the music history, the work of Bach and others, uh, there were some modifications, compromises and decisions taken that mean that the notes we use today, on a piano especially, are not quite the ones that exist in the natural harmonic overtone scale. Okay? So things like thirds, major thirds, um, are actually officially a compromise of an interval, harmonically speaking, which is why barbershoppers uh, try to sing thirds slightly differently than you would on a piano. It's why if you listen to a bar, it's why chords lock and ring in barbershop, because we're matching these frequencies better than you would on a piano. Not saying piano, so pianos are kind of consistently out of tune, but for a very good reason. I'm not going to go into the reason now, um, it's all to do with being able to play in different keys so that you can therefore have one instrument that can play effectively in every key that you could possibly imagine. But to do that, you end up compromising slightly the interrelationship between these fundamental frequencies. OK, so don't worry. But the thing is now when I hear correct um, intervals, as in mathematically correct intervals, my brain thinks they're wrong because I'm so used to piano chord scale versions. Okay, so don't worry too much about this. There's a lot more information there, but we're going to move on just so you kind of know where scales come from. A lot of our notes come, therefore, as a recreation of, of natural harmonics that existed already. Now, we're not going to go into this, um, but in singing, we often try to tune to the overtone series more than we do to uh, a piano which is why sometimes choruses, some choruses of you in barbershop choruses, they might use a piano or a keyboard, but often they don't 
because sometimes it might a piano would say you're singing not the correct note but you know that it feels right you know you know when you just move that little bit of tuning and suddenly a chord just goes and it locks in when you're especially when you're singing a cappella and accompanied and you hear all these over you hear all these other notes that kind of spring out of nowhere that's when you're really tuning those notes and those harmonics are kind of matching up and forming notes that you're not singing but it kind of makes you hear these notes because of this kind of natural um these natural frequencies so just very quickly uh, just before i go into the next slide and this is the, this is the thing when you sing you are singing multiple frequencies okay so if i was to sing one note and i was to ask debbie to sing the exact same note would you be able to tell which was me and which was Debbie? If we just sang an R, ah, would you be able to tell the difference between mine and Debbie's voice on the same note? Mm. Yes, probably you would. Okay. Uh, Debbie, can we attempt that, please? Yep. Okay, so I'm going to sing a note, then Debbie's going to sing a note, and I want you to see if there's a difference. We'll do it to a nice pure R, Debbie. Sing the exact same note as me after me. Let's see if this works. Here we go. <coughs> Here's my note. Uh... And you. Uh... Excellent. Now, well, did we both, first and foremost, did we generally both sing the same note? Yes, we yeah. did. More or less. I mean, you, you maybe if you put it through one of those little phone apps, you could say, oh, well, actually, you were three cents higher at that point. Yeah. But generally, we would perceive that as the same note. If we sang the exact same frequency, I would still not sound the same as Debbie. OK, now this is because we all have our own harmonic fingerprint. OK, because my note, when I sing one note, there is the original what's called the fundamental, the fundamental note that I'm singing. OK. Uh, however, there's lots of other harmonic overtones which make my voice sound like my voice and make Debbie's voice sound like her voice. We have our own harmonic fingerprint. So if I, and I can slightly, I'm, and I'll show you a woman who can do it very well in a second, I can slightly change my harmonic fingerprint by the, uh, the aperture of my mouth. So I can take some of those overtones away. Okay, and I can, or I can add some, or I can make you hear some more than others. So, if I sing a note, uh, and I try and do something with it, uh, I'm slightly changing the vowel, but do you notice that when it kind of goes out, it sounds, the note sounds brighter but it's the same fundamental frequency. Does that make sense? It's like if you hear a bass trying to sing high, it still sounds a bit like a bass. It doesn't sound like that bass suddenly has turned into an alto and suddenly has a lady's voice, okay? Because the harmonics of that person's voice is still there. Now, you can play around with this. So when you say about vocal placement, you can often send your placement somewhere else. I have naturally quite a, for a man, quite a forward placement, meaning I've got quite a lot of um, quite pingy overtones in my harmonic fingerprint. Okay, Some men singing the same note as me would have less of those and might have more of this kind of lower sound. Um, neither, by the way, is better. There's not a thing about better, it's just different. Okay? For certain types of music, you might want a certain type of voice, a, a voice that has a certain kind of fingerprint that works. Okay? Um, but I could make myself sound bassy. I mean, you can see I'm doing a silly face there, but suddenly all the brightness, all those bright tones in my voice are going just by the front of my mouth. Now, even if Debbie was to make her mouth shaped exactly the same as mine, it still wouldn't sound the same because where the vocal cords vibrate, everything from that point is, is different in me than it is Debbie. The length of my vocal tract is different than Debbie. The size and the, the resonating space in my head is different than Debbie. Everything that happens after the vocal folds is me. That's what makes me sound like me, okay? The vocal folds, if you actually put a microphone just above the vocal folds where the vibration happens, where they vibrate, etc., that doesn't sound very different. So Debbie's vocal folds on that note and my vocal folds on that note would sound 
very similar. Not identical because her vocal folds will be a different size than mine, so there still will be some difference, but they'll be very, 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 very similar if you were to listen to that sound at its initial point, okay? Everything else after that is what gives you your harmonic fingerprint because it, it accentuates certain frequencies and allows certain frequencies through. It, it deadens certain frequencies and we, are, and we can, what you do with your tongue, your soft palate, all those, and all the stuff you get vocal coaches work with you on um, is what they're trying to do. They're trying to move your voice into a place to either get rid of certain issues frequency-wise or accentuate certain things to make it match and when you might have had barbershop coaches and they're always bang on about lead bass match okay getting your lead singer to match the bass singer okay thankfully sometimes that is slightly changing now but actually we sound best when we're being our most efficient with our own voices as opposed to make my bass yeah who has quite a back not backwards in a bad way but he has quite a kind of a slightly further type of darker placed voice uh, and I have quite a far, far, far forward. The problem is if you push him forward, he's making himself put a lot of pressure. And actually, he sounds then slightly pressured. So actually not forcing him to try and sing like me. Okay. So again, vocal science is moving forwards all the time. Uh, so yeah, you may have had some coaching in the past where they've said, your lead bass matches where it's at. Yes and no. There's, there's always like things change. And actually, we want our voices to be efficient. But I will never sound like Debbie. And Debbie will never sound like me. I'm not sure who's more sad about that. Uh, but again, I think sometimes I'd like to sound like Debbie and possibly sometimes she might like to sound like me. But it will never happen. We have our own voices. And we, again, that's why we always say you can only do the best that you can um, is because you could try an awful long time to sound exactly like me or Debbie and you would never sound like us. If you try to force your voice to sound like someone else's, that's not what your voice does. That's not how it sounds. And you just need to get your voice to sound its best, whatever that may be. Okay, so I'm um, just going to quickly reshare my screen and now move on to uh, the next part where we actually get into scales. But I wanted to do that bit because if we don't understand a little bit of the background of where we're, what an octave is, yeah, it is, it is something that exists in nature as opposed to someone just decided, just mandatory, just like, just randomly, oh yeah, let's just split, let's just split it and just call that an octave and we'll just tell people that's what it is. No, we can hear an octave, um, we call it an octave, it's just a doubling and a, and a half or a doubling of those, um, of those frequencies. Now I'm just going to play this video, you may have seen this before, this is a woman um, called Ana Maria, she's very smug, but she's very talented, so she can be smug. Um, she is what's called a polyphonic overtone singer. To explain what I mean by those overtones, she can filter her mouth to create two notes simultaneously and sing in harmony with herself. By the way, don't worry, this is not going to happen in the collective. It takes a long time to be able to do this. Uh, this is not our next kind of thing where we can only have two people, but you can have a quartet singing and only two people there. It doesn't work that way, okay? Not even if you... I think she might be a witch, so I think we might need to drown her at some point. Um, but it will explain to you, and you can hear these overtones. The overtones she's creating are the ones that we find in nature. If you listen to some of them... They sound, some of them sound out of tune. If it sounds out of tune, that's because we think things that are in tune, they're actually out of tune. That's the compromises. She's singing the correct overtones that nature provides. And it, she is amazing. So let me just play. It's a few minutes long, this video, but you will, you will definitely go and find more overtone singing after this point because she is awesome. So have a listen. Can you, oh, I'll just share my sound. Just let me know if you can hear this when it comes on. There's no sound at the moment, but just let me know when you can. Hello, I am Anna Maria and I'm an overtone singer. And I'm going to tell you something about polyphonic singing today. Overtone singing is a voice technique where one person sings two notes at the same time. So smug. <laughs>
Now, just very quickly, I'm just going to pause it at that point. She's actually doing that, okay? That is, it's not like, I'm not going to get to the end of this video and say, ha ha, it was all a lie. It's been done with computer technology. You can tell that she's moving her mouth. All she's doing here, and I say all she's doing, she's basically changing her mouth and the shape inside her mouth to stop certain frequencies and to only let other frequencies through. So she's basically changing the harmonic fingerprint slightly of her voice, okay? So I will continue playing this. She is really doing this, by the way, okay? She is really doing this. So this is not a lie, it does exist. It's not fake news. So this was the overtone scale on one fundamental. I can also choose an overtone and move the fundamental. <laughs> That one's not as easy to hear, but basically the overtone that she's creating is So that note was in all of her notes. As she moved the fundamental, as in the main note she's singing, she's moving her mouth to keep that, that overtone consistent. Ridiculously hard. Ridiculously hard to <clears throat> see. Okay, here we go. So... Oh, what's today's it? One second. I'll just do that. Yeah. So I can choose a fundamental and have the overtone scale, or I choose an overtone and have the undertone scale. This is where she gets really smug. If I want to sing a special melody, and there are melody notes that don't fit to the overtone scale from one fundamental, then I need to find another fundamental to sing this note. And for that, there are often different possibilities, and I choose this fundamental that fits harmonically best with the melody line. And for polyphonic singing, there are different possibilities to build scales and to move notes. So I can move the overtone with the fundamental in parallel. <laughs> fundamental in steps or in smaller steps or even smaller I can also move the overtone and the fundamental in the opposite direction. scale also works in major. Major scale is harder for her. Major scale does not fit the overtones theories as well. <laughs> and with these tools, I can tools. sing, for example, folk songs. In She's going to sing a folk song voice. now on her own.
Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Oh, she's just far too nice. So, um, yeah. So if you hadn't seen that before, it's real. She can do that. Okay. So that explains. Um, I'll just quickly stop sharing for a sec. So when we say about overtones, um, that naturally exist, and all those overtones naturally exist in her voice. All she's doing there is filtering using the the internal shape of her mouth and her lips to basically allow us to hear some of those notes like on their own screamingly like out screaming out okay but all those um heart frequencies exist in her voice naturally and they do in nature um and she's just a lot she's just worked on maximizing how we can hear and perceive those sounds okay so when we say a harmonic fingerprint all those frequencies are in your voice in the same way that if i was to drop my brick on the floor there's loads of frequencies there are notes when i drop a brick on the floor the issue is that there's so many frequencies that our brain does not perceive that as anything that is tuned so the same with a drum a snare drum if you look at the frequency spectrum if you were to hit a snare drum it has loads of frequencies Okay? And sometimes at the end of a snare drum, if someone hits it, you can, all, you can kind of slightly pick out a note. But the initial hit, you don't hear a note because there's so many frequencies. Our brain picks it up as a noise as opposed to a note. Okay? And, that, and that's basically, yeah, so untuned percussion in orchestra, they still have frequency, but the frequency is not like layered and there is not a, a, a fundamental frequency that is being played or, or struck uh, there's just lots of frequencies all in one go we perceive that as noise okay so it's all about how, how our brain hears things okay so that's the first kind of thing which kind of explains um, frequencies and sound and stuff like that we're now going to get onto scales okay which I know is what we're supposed to be getting onto but I didn't want to not explain the, the original kind of where it comes from okay because it is fascinating and she's a witch um, so um, what's a daisy uh, yes uh, where are we Oh yeah, here we go. Now, here we get through, and I'm going to go through this in, in relatively quickly, um, but, you, just, you know, I'll go through it hopefully in some detail. Now, in Western music, we didn't always have major and minor scales, okay? That's the first thing to say. I could go back historically and talk about the use of modes and modes that preceded major and minor scales, but that would, whilst be interesting, would not necessarily help us with understanding key signatures, okay, which are derived from the major and minor scales. If you ever want to look into modes, modes still get used nowadays. So in certain types of like rock music and jazz music and stuff, they still use modes. Modal music is still a thing. Um, but when we say scales, um, there are lots of types of scales. As I said at the beginning of this, the octatonic scale is, an, is a scale system that has eight notes, not seven, like what we use uh, to, today. There's pentatonic scale, which again also is used in different types of world music. There's the uh, tetratonic scale, which is also used where that octave is split into four notes, or five, or six, or seven. And there's, there's different types of scale systems used all around the world, where different cultures have decided to chop that octave, that fundamental distance between one note and the perceived higher version of the same note, to split it into different amounts. We have in our in Western music, the chromatic scale, where it's split into 12, okay? All of the, you know, there, some of them are based on fundamental frequencies, some of them are based upon compromises and decisions, which is why when you listen to, if you ever listen to any music play on a gamelan music, it sounds out of tune. So if you ever listen to like Indonesian or Bali kind of gamelan from Bali or Indonesia or kind of Java, uh, you listen to it and it sounds out of tune to your ear, to, to my ears certainly. My westernized ears listen to Indonesian gamelan and sometimes I kind of think, ooh, yeah, they need to tune that, that need to tune that xylophone up a little bit, but, but, but it's not out of tune. It's in, a different, it's in a different tuning system of which people from that country are 100% used to, and our music would sound out of tune to them. Okay, so what we're talking about here is our scale system. And I say our um, from the point of view of a European westernized scale system, uh, which is what we use in still in barbershop, and it's what we use in classical music and popular music. Okay, it is not the only scale system, nor is it better. Um, so, major scale first. Uh, we're going to look at the major scale. The major scale is constructed um, with the uh, formula 
And again, a tone, by the way, is two semitones. I know if you're in America, you have whole tones and half tones. I'm going to use like a UK terminology, a semitone is a half, a half step, a half tone for you, okay? So um, a major scale is basically you start off on a note, you move up by a tone, that's two semitones, uh, you move up by a tone, then by a semitone, tone, 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 semitone. Now don't worry about that, I'll go through an example of this. If we go through the C major scale, this is to start off scales, you can't understand key signatures if we don't understand scales. Because the whole reason we use sharps and flats is so we can maintain the sound of a major scale no matter what note we start on. That's what gives us sharps and flats in the first place. So a C major scale, our starting note is C and you've got it there in the score and you've got it there on a piano. The next note is two semitones up, one, two, that's a tone. It's a tone up, full step. Then a semitone into an E. Then a tone, sorry, sorry, then a tone, then a semitone into from an E to an F. Then a tone from an, uh, an F to a G. Another tone from a G to an A. Another tone from an A to a B. And finally, that last little movement between the seventh and the major and the uh, octave, we get to our final semitone. Now that is the, score, the, the scale of C major, all the white notes on a piano. Okay, now the scale came first, the piano came second. Okay, generally speaking, but, but, yeah, but, but imagine that it's not that they decided they, they invented a piano and then thought, oh, well, let's use a scale of just all these white notes on the piano. That seems the easiest thing to do, doesn't it? There was obviously the, the piano was invented, um, and it was invented, and therefore we move that tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone. That's every, and every major scale follows that pattern, no matter where it starts. And I'll give you an example of this, and you've got, you've got access to this PowerPoint presentation. The, the pattern exists with every major scale. If I was to start the E flat major scale, so hence instead of C being my starting note, it was an E flat, I'd start with an E flat and I would still have to move up a tone. And then, a, then, and then a tone, and then a semitone, and then tone, tone. And otherwise, it wouldn't sound like a major scale. A major scale being... That's what a major scale sounds like. It wouldn't matter whether I moved down. The gap between all those different notes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 to the 8, is always the same, no matter where I start. For that to happen, if we start on the note E flat, which is this little black note here, if we move a tone, so we count two steps, one, two, our second note is an F. If we then move two, we get to a G. Then we move one. That takes us to an A flat, not an A. So we end up using a black note and we write the little flat symbol because it's not a standard white note A. We started on a black note E, E flat, because it's a little bit, it's the black note just below E. We then end up on A flat, the, the, the black note just below A, so that we can keep the pattern of the major scale the same. If we move to a normal A, it wouldn't be a major scale because it wouldn't sound the same. Okay, And therefore, if you wrote a melody in, in C major, if you play that melody in E-flat major, it should sound exactly the same, not sound different. Okay, does that make sense? So you want it to sound the same when you move it up or down like notes, so the starting note changes. That's the same thing. If, if we were to take, a, like for example, the White Cliffs of Dover that we did with the collective, our first song was originally a male arrangement. Okay, it was in a different key. And if I, then I moved it up for collective. Well, if I moved it up for the collective, but the distance between the notes was then not the same, the melody would sound all wrong, yeah? Instead of, there'll be blue bands over my, there'll be blue bands over, it'd be like, oh, if I was, if I was ignoring the major scale and just stuck it with the same amounts of sharps and flats and just ignored scales, it would sound wrong. It wouldn't be, the, it wouldn't sound the same, okay? Um, so, um, we move from the A flat, two steps to a B flat. We then move to a C, to a D, to an E flat. That gives us here three flats. We don't count the E flat twice, by the way. 
So to make this E flat major scale sound the same as C major, C major just has all the white notes, E flat major to make it sound, pardon me, make it sound the same ends up using three flats on the piano. So it sounds identical. Okay, it sounds like a same major scale, a couple of notes higher. Okay, C major scale sounds the same, move it up a couple of notes, still sounds the same, still a major scale. In order for that to be the case, we have to use these flats. Question, why are we calling them flats, not sharps? Some of you might be thinking that. Deborah Linzer, what do you think? It depends on what, what key it, it is. Uh, uh, e yes. flat is also a D sharp, depending on what key you're in. Yeah. Now, sometimes, again, if students at my school were to say, well, why is it in A flat and not a G sharp? The very simple way of saying this is, if we look at the chord of the, the scale of C, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Every letter is used. A scale in our, in, our, in our Western tradition, every letter has to be used. Does that make sense? So every letter has to be used. If it's a scale, it's moving by step. Every alphabetical letter has to be used. So in the scale of E flat major, we're basically going to go E, F, G, A, B, C, D. Wow. Okay? The fact that, and therefore, when we get to E, F, G, the fourth one is always going to be an A. It's going to be an A something. It's either going to be an A, an A flat, or an A sharp. Okay? And those of you with a bit of theory knowledge, you might then go, what about double flats and double sharps? If you already know that, you shouldn't be here. I'm only kidding. Um, so don't worry about that as well. I could explain that, but I'm not going to yet because it makes people's brains hurt. But really, in any scale, we have to have all the letters. It's just a simple matter. Of we, otherwise, we've got two Gs. We have E, F, G. G sharp, and then we don't have any A. We move from G sharp to like A, 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 yeah, like A sharp, and then we go straight to C. Well, there's no B in it. We've missed a we've missed a note out. Does that make sense? So the simplest way of saying it, I always say to my students, is you just have to tick off every letter, because by its definition, wherever you start, if you can do an octave, you're going to have used all the letters from A to G in it somewhere. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good explanation. Yeah, so you only just need to worry about, you're going to get a G. It might be a G sharp, it might be a G, it might be a G flat. That, and then that's, the, yeah, as long as you tick off one of each of those letters, then that's why we need to use sharps. And that's why in, in this example, it's all flats, because that's the way, I mean, it's all flats because we start on E flat. So there'll be no scale, major minor scale, which starts in a major scale that starts on a flat and then uses sharps. If it starts on a flat, it's going to use flats, okay? And you're not going to get a scale, generally speaking, in this, that uses sharps and flats simultaneously, okay? In the major scale. Mine is a little bit different, but we'll get to that in a bit. There's a little thing with uh, the pesky harmonic minor, uh, which we need to deal with, okay? So, that's the E-flat major scale. Follows exactly the same pattern as a C major scale, and you could form any major scale as long as the pattern goes tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone. That's, that's all you need to know. If you follow the same pattern, it will sound like a major scale, and you will pick up black notes at some point. Okay? To give an example with D major, D major is one that is going to force us to use sharps, not flats. Because our first note is D. We then move to E. The next note is going to be an F because that's the next note in the, that's the next letter in the alphabet. We know it's going to be an F something. However, we've got to move a tone. So it's going to end up on that black note, which could either be an F sharp or a G flat. But it's the third note, D, E, F. It's going to be an F sharp because it's the third note. We have to use an F, so it's going to be an F sharp. The next note takes us to a G. The semitone jump to a G. A tone takes us to an A. Another tone takes us to a C. The next jump is another full tone jump. C sharp. The black note in between C and D. But we, we're not going to have a D flat in the scale of D. That, that would be weird because you've got two Ds then. One of them is a D and one of them is a D flat. So you'd have a C sharp there. So the scale of D has got 
two sharps. F sharp. I mean, you're C not sharing your screen. Do you think you're sharing your screen? Because you know. I did. Yes. My apologies. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so just very quickly, as I was just showing there, D into an E, the full step into F sharp, because we're following the pattern. A small step into G, full step to A, full step to B. The last full step takes us to this little black note here, which could be a C sharp or a D flat, but it's a C sharp because we've already used D because it's the scale of D. We're not going to use D flat and D in the same scale because we then wouldn't have used a C at all and we'd be breaking our use all the letters of the alphabet from A to G in what we're doing. Okay? You could do that in any scale you choose as long as you follow tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone. That's it. Okay? Now, um, now, it is, as it says here, it's possible to build any major scale. Start on the first note, follow the formula. So we could, for example, uh, start on the note C sharp and follow it through, and we would find out that we use every single sharp. Okay? C sharp major uses all the sharps. Hooray. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the one. If I'm in an orchestra, uh, it's singing, it's not an issue. You'll notice as well, uh, when you're singing, you don't care what the key is because the sharps and flats are not more, it's not more difficult to sing an F sharp than it is an F. I, apart from obviously vocal range, but it's not like if you see a piece of music that's in like E flat or in D, it's not like, you're, oh, I don't like flats. I much prefer singing in sharps. It makes no difference to singers. It makes a massive difference to orchestral players and instrumentalists. Like on a violin, I, li I like playing in flat keys. I don't like playing in sharp keys. Okay, I'm an, I, as a violinist. Okay, I love playing in E flat. E flat's brilliant. Okay, uh, the idea of playing in F sharp on a violin, F sharp major on a violin, no thank you. No, I can't use my open strings for a start. Uh, no, 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 I don't want to. And there'll be other instrumentalists will not like certain keys. So certain instruments. But for singers, we're lucky. Keys don't, apart from affecting our range. So you might say, well, there's a big difference for me singing in F sharp than G because I can't sing G. <laughs> it's too high. Um, but actually, there's no difference in actually the, as part, apart from vocal range, there's no difference in us singing in C sharp minor uh, to, to C minor. If, we, if it's within our range, there's no difference. Okay, we don't really worry. We just sing it um, unless we're a particular score reader. And then we sometimes get more accidentals and things. And we might think it's a little bit messy when we're singing something with seven sharps in the key signature. It just seems a little bit like excessive. The arranger could have just moved it, da moved it down by one semitone. We're in, then we're in C major instead. Then we've got no sharps and no flats. And then, yeah, and also it's a semitone lower. So it's easier to sing. Um, any, anyone who gives you an arrangement in seven sharps, just shake your head. And, and know that they think they're really clever. Um, unless it's David Wright, he is really clever. Don't question him. Um, so, now, we're going to go through minor scales. Is there any question about major scales at this point? I don't think there probably will be, but generally, it's a pattern. It's a pattern that was decided upon that sounds like a major scale. Okay, Mike Schilder. The, uh, you, and you might get into this later, but yep. for me, the challenge with scales is always being, if I'm looking at sheet music, um, I can look at the signature and going like, ah, this is the scale with one F sharp in it. Yep. But don't ask me what scale that is. You know, like the scale is defined by the starting note, yep. but the, to, to me, the starting note seems almost irrelevant. What I need yep. to know is that there's an F sharp. You know, yep. So I just, I just do all the notes yep. as normal, but, but with any time that I see an F, it's actually an F sharp. Yeah. So, um, and, 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 but I've never really successfully found any kind of mnemonic to translate that into what scale is this actually in? It's yeah. the scale with F sharp in it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One hundred percent. That gets covered. So yeah, you're gonna we're gonna hopefully get a little bit of a nugget, and you'll be like, ah, okay, cool. Now I'm gonna go through minor scales, folks. I'm gonna say that you might want to go through this um, in a little bit more detail yourself because I'm mindful of time, and I really want to get to the key signature bit. Major, major scales we define as sounding happy, okay? It's a horrible way of defining them, but we do define them as happy. Major scale sounds happy. I hate myself for saying it, but it, it, for the moment it will suffice. Major, happy. Minor, even worse, sad. Uh, uh, pfft, uh, yeah, 
I've heard major music, which is very sad, and minor music, which sounds beautiful and happy, but let's not worry too much about that at the moment. There are three types of minor scale, okay? Now, you might think to yourself, why? I'm not going to go into that, apart from to say that there is a reason, and it does make a difference, but it's not the remit of this education session, okay? The remit is to try and get to key signatures and to give us a brief understanding of this information. There is reasons why we use natural minor. There's reasons why we want to use harmonic and the melodic minor. Uh, and as you would imagine, harmonic minor generally is used when we're constructing chords and harmony. Melodic is usually for melody lines. Uh, and there is historical context. There's quite a lot of information about why this is the case. I'm not going to be able to cover all of those reasons. Um, that would be a different education session entirely, the minor scales. Um, but yeah, just to kind of say, I know it, but I'm not going to go through it all now. Now, the first thing is, the most important scale for you to kind of understand initially is the natural minor. The natural minor uh, goes tone, semitone, tone, tone, semitone, tone, tone. And actually, it is the key signature version of a minor scale. Okay, and I'll get to that later. It's the key signature version. So if we build an A natural minor scale, it uses all the white notes of the piano. Okay, uh, it also defines itself very close to a, a mode called the Aeolian mode, which is what the A minor scale was derived from. Don't worry about that, but safe to say the nat A natural minor scale is, yeah, it's, it's the A natural minor scale. And it follows this pattern. And that's the one we need to learn and then when we get to harmonic and melodic, we just learn how we change those, the, how we change the natural minor scale as opposed to its completely different scale. We always start with natural minor, then we modify. So an A natural minor scale. Our starting note will be not surprisingly an A. Be great if the, the scale of A natural minor wasn't an A. That would be an interesting call. Um, so it's an A. We then move up to a, a whole tone to B. So it's just like the major scale, apart from we use a different pattern. We move by different notes. We end up at the same point, at an octave, but the steps, the lot of half steps and whole steps, are different. So it ends up having a different kind of flavour. So we start off with a tone. We then go to a semitone move, up to C. We then move up to a D with our whole tone. And you'll notice at the moment all the white notes are being used. There's no sharps or flats in this. Another whole tone takes us up to the E. A, a semitone goes up to the F, a whole tone to the G, and we finish off with another whole tone. We therefore see that A natural minor is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. Follows the same rules of the major scale when we said a scale has to use all the notes of the, all the letters of the alphabet from A to G. The nat minor scales have to do exactly the same. So they still have to follow and use every note, every letter of the alphabet from A to G at some point okay um Simon, and, yes is so i learned that c major the relative minor is a minor is correct is it different be, it's natural equals relative it's just like yes yes so uh, a minor is the relative minor of c and we'll touch on that a little bit later um but just to say at the moment when we say my relative minor basically the 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 white notes a natural minor uses all the white notes and so does c major so therefore we call them relatives because they use all the same notes so a minor uses exactly the same notes as c major they sound very different but they are called the relative minor a is a minor is the relative minor now when we talk about a minor we don't refer to a minor as a harmonic minor or a melodic minor or a natural minor it's just in music a minor However, um, as we'll see uh, um, in a little bit, uh, sometimes you may get certain notes in a piece of music that's in A minor, which might not fit with the key signature, the accidental of G sharp, which we're going to look at later on, uh, which suddenly pops up in the piece of A minor when we're following the harmonic minor scale, which we'll, we'll go through there, that in a second. But yeah, you're 100% right. A minor is the relative of C, and there's a way of working out the relative for every key that's very simple that I'll do in a, in a moment. So if we look at, and we're going to just use C natural minor now because we can compare C natural minor um, uh, to, the, to the next lot. So I've just transitioned to C natural minor. It follows the same pattern as A natural minor, tone, semitone, tone, tone, semitone, tone, tone. It has three flats. 
Okay, as it walks up using every letter of the alphabet on its way, it picks up those three flats of E flat, A flat, and B flat. Okay, um, and we would therefore give it the 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 idea of the second note of the scale, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and then the octave. So the first note is note one or the tonic. We then get two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight or one, the octave. Okay. So when I might talk about the seventh of the scale, that's just the seventh step, or the fifth would be the fifth step. When we count intervals, the first note we start on is number one. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we get back to num note number one with the eighth. Now, if we look at the harmonic minor, the harmonic minor, all it does is you raise the seventh note by a semitone. Okay? Now, if I was to sing you a standard natural minor, Da 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 Okay? Da 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 Sounds like slightly mournful but fine. The harmonic minor is exactly the same until the penultimate note. Da 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 you get that leading note, that little, that leading note, da, da, you get that in there, okay? Now, if I was to sing the, the natural minor, it's a lot more, yeah, it's used a little bit more in slightly more, like, again, it sounds a bit more kind of impressionistic. It's not quite what kind of like Debussy or kind of would use, but it has a little less pull. The natural minor has less reactivity and pull. The harmonic minor becomes very, very, that, that risen seventh has loads of power to it. So here's the um, natural minor. It's very flowing. It has a sense of kind of water. It has a flow at the top. Okay, it's like, yeah, nice. Harmonic, it has a it's yeah it's got a lot more kind of now some people my students would listen to that and go sounds like egypt music okay now there's something in that but probably it sounds like the westernized version of what they think music might have sounded like from that neck of the woods not that actually so it's a very, very not like Egypt music, but there is the, the basically that what that forms is what's called, and I won't go into detail on this too much. It gives an augmented second. An augmented second is the same as a minor third, but it's not. Um, so it does have that kind of kind of Middle Eastern kind of flavour to it because the augmented second is used in music of those countries more so than it is in a lot of Western classical music tradition. Again, not an expert on world music, but that's why it does have a slightly oriental feel uh, to it, that kind of like Middle Eastern kind of vibe going on uh, because of the augmented second. So what a harmonic minor does is it makes, and again, don't worry too much about this. Some of you might know this. If you're in a minor key, chord five, chord five, like the fifth chord, no, chord number five, in harmonic minor, is still a major chord, not a minor chord. Okay, that's because the the major five chord always wants to take you back to chord one. So it's all about it's all about what's called the tonic dominant relationship, um, which I won't go into now because that's not chords and we're not on chords yet. But there is a reason why the harmonic minor is used is because when you use a major chord five, a major dominant, it gains loads of extra energy and pushes that through into um, chord one. Whereas if you use natural, the natural minor, you use minor five chord, it, it kind of can drift. It doesn't have to, it doesn't feel like it needs to go back to chord one. And if you're a composer, your job is generally to keep on taking you back to chord one before taking you on a journey around the chords again, which then end up back on chord one. 
So there was reasons behind that, and that's a very generic description of why they use the harmonic minor, uh, but just safe to say, there is reasons. So the harmonic minor is what would give you, and I'll just quickly stop showing my screen for a second, harmonic minor would give you um, sharps or flats in your score. So Deborah was saying about A minor, and the A minor shares its key signature with C major. 100% it does. However, if you ever look at a piece of music and it's in A minor, it randomly, at some points, will have G sharps. It'll have sharps in the piece of music because it's following the harmonic minor with, when it's looking at chords and G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G is the seventh note of that scale and a sharpened G will be at a G sharp. And that's why you see these odd sharps in a piece of music. Not always, but so if, if I'm teaching music to my students, I'll look at a piece of music, there's nothing in the key signature, and I, and I yeah, but suddenly I look and there's sharps. And it's not changing key. If those sharps happen to be also be the seventh note of that scale, it's a minor, it's in a minor key. And for my students, I often say, if you're not sure whether a piece of music is in a major or a minor key, one, look at the note it starts on, Two, look at the note it finishes on. If it finishes on an A, it starts on an A, you might be an A minor, not C major, okay? But also, if there's loads of little sharps in it, and those sharps are generally G sharps, much more likely that you're going to be an A minor. If you can see accidentals in a piece of music, uh, and it's a relatively simple piece of music that doesn't have lots of key changes, and usually an arranger will put the key change in the music for you, so you'll know that's not it. If you get lots of accidentals, you're probably in a minor key. Okay, and we'll look at how you would decide upon that uh, in a second. Okay, so that's the harmonic minor. The melodic minor, as we would imagine with the name of it, is used more so in melodies. The melodic minor, you basically raise both the sixth and the seventh. Okay, again, there's reasons. I'm not going to go into the why at the moment. I'm just going to say it is the case. So to convert C natural minor to C melodic, you raise the sixth and the seventh and it ends up finishing like a major like a major scale. It starts off minor and ends up sounding a bit major. <coughs> Here's what it sounds like. Natural minor first, then I'll sing the, the uh, melodic minor. Natural first. Back to our kind of flowing, slightly sad water. Yeah? Melodic minor. Da, 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 da. Okay, I didn't do it descending because that often isn't used. So melodic minor on the way up again. Da, 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 da. Those those little rises and lifts. It ends exactly the same as a major scale. Okay, but it starts off as minor. So it kind of has the sense of minor. It starts you off in sad town. But then actually it lifts itself up on the on the other notes and kind of it kind of almost it's about as major as a minor scale gets. However, melodic minor is only used when you're going up. When you go down, they usually then use the natural minor scale. And this is when I played the violin, I hated melodic minors to play them because I, melodic minor you had to move your fingers on the way up and then move them on the way down they it wasn't symmetrical and to my mind a scale that's not symmetrical should be burned okay especially with my I wasn't very good with my fingering on my violin because I got fat fingers and my violin was dinky it's like you wouldn't imagine I'm a violinist it's like ah I, I hated melodic minor scales I always wanted them to say harmonic because that was easy no worries melodic hated it here's melodic up and it, it turns into natural mind on the way down. Have a listen. It sounds lovely. It has a it has a rise at the at the on the way up, and it then has a fall on the way down, which gives it a real romantic edge. It doesn't sound like water. It sounds a lot more kind of flowing and kind of well romantic. It sounds like a bit more passionate, okay? Um, it's like I have to perform that scale, okay? That's the melodic minor scale. It just marginally changes the pattern, but all you need to remember is the natural minor has its, um, its pattern, 
which I, I'm not going to say now because I'll probably get the pattern wrong. Um, but the one you've already written down, it, it does follow the same pattern for natural. For harmonic, you only raise the seventh to give it that kind of, kind of Middle Eastern feel because it really works better with chords. For melodic, you raise the six and the seven on the way up only. Okay, and you don't need to worry because if you're compo unless you're composing music, uh, you don't need to worry about this. But just to say, if people talk about the different types of minor scale, by the way, this doesn't change the key signature. So the melodic minor does not change the key signature. It doesn't suddenly mean that you end up having to change your key signature. Your key signature always is based upon the natural minor scale. None of this stuff changes the key signature. If you're using melodic it will put it in the score as accidentals. It would put sharps or naturals or flats or whatever it wanted to do to make those melodic or harmonic changes within the score. It would not change the key signature, okay? So that's scales. What about key signatures? This is how far we've had to go so far just to get to key signatures. If I just started on key signatures, I would hate myself because it wouldn't take very long, but you wouldn't understand why. There will be no, you know, the key signatures are only needed because we have to keep the same pattern when using major and minor scales, which is why sharps and flats get used, okay? And there is a pattern to this. The pattern, is this is where I like this bit because it's easy. It makes sense, and it just means you can remember a couple of bits of info and impress your friends. Sharps and flats are always added to music in the same order. Always. In a key signature. They add in the same order, always, okay? The sharps always start with an F. So if, you, if you've got a piece of music and it has one sharp in the key signature, that will always be an F sharp. There will never be a piece of music where it's got an A sharp in the key signature and it's only got one sharp. If it has an A sharp, it will it'll have five sharps because it'll have four sharps before. So they always get added in the same order, always. And I didn't know this. Until I was uh, until after uh, until I was in my degree, and someone mentioned it. No one bothered to teach me this in GCSE. My teacher never told me. My violin teacher never told me that the sharps got added in a certain order. I hadn't really worked it out myself. I'd never really cared that much, but I wasn't told, and it annoyed me when I found out because I'm like that would have made it so much easier to remember because I had to memorize my key signatures without using the the little trick, trick I'm going to give you today. I had to memorize the darn things, and I didn't like doing that. It took time, and there's a really easy way of doing it. Flats always go B, E, A, D, G, C, F. Always. They always get added to a piece of music. B goes first. B flat's the most common flat used. Then E flat, and A flat, and D flat, and G flat, C flat, F flat. If you get an F flat in your key signature, you've got seven flats. And again, get a different arranger. That's all I'm saying, okay? They're trying to be fancy fangled, okay? Oh, if anyone ever, by the way, says to you the joke, I really like music in B sharp major. B sharp major, by the way, is C major and has no sharps and flats, yeah? Shake your head. They're trying to be clever, yeah? But just, just don't, don't rise to it. Don't ride to their B-sharp major bad pun, okay? Music theory puns are the worst puns, okay? Just letting you know that. And by the way, if you've ever used that joke that you like music in B-sharp major, for shame on you, sir or madam. So, sharps. You only need to remember this, this rhyme. Father Charles goes down and ends battle. That's the order of the sharps. Father Charles goes down and ends battle. That's the sharps and how they get added. Father Charles goes down and ends battle. Okay? Thankfully, there are other ones. Father Christmas go, got, like, David an electric blanket or something. That one's not as good. The reason Father Charles goes down and ends battle is better is because flats, battle ends and down goes Charles's father. It's exactly the same. You can reverse it. So Father Charles goes down and ends battle. That's the order you add the sharps. The flats get added. Battle ends and down goes Charles's father. That's how you remember the order of the flats. That's why I like that one, because you only need to remember one thing. Okay? And I'll, so I'll, so that's, that's the order of the flats. So reverse order. So the, the first flat is the last sharp to be added. Okay? 
Now, I'm just going to leave that there for you because some people are right. And again, you'll have access to this PowerPoint. And here comes the truths, the truths that make people feel better than you, but they're not. Okay? Here's the info. You only need to learn two key signatures. That's it. And you will be able to work out the rest of them. You only need to remember that C major has no sharps and flats. And that F major has one flat. They are the only two you need to memorize. Everything else you can use the following trick. The following very simple thing that works for every single key signature. Okay? So C major, none. F major, one flat. If you have any sharps in a key signature, find the last sharp, the one that's furthest to the right, go up by one semitone, that is your major key. Always. So if you have that F sharp in that piece of music, and there's only one sharp, one semitone above F sharp is G, it's G major. If you have four sharps, Father Charles goes down. Fourth sharp is a D, so if it's a D sharp, one semitone up from D sharp is E. E major has four sharps. Okay? If you go five sharps, Father Charles goes down and A sharp is your fifth sharp. One semitone above A sharp is B. B major has five sharps. So seven sharps is no more difficult than one sharp. Yeah? To work out. So seven sharps, Father Charles goes down and ends battle, B sharp. One note semitone above C sharp. This is where you might get it wrong. What note is B sharp, did we say previously? It's a C. What's one note above C? A C sharp. C sharp major has seven sharps. Okay? So even at the seven, as long as you remember that a B sharp is a C, you might want to, yeah, the only thing you really need is a picture of a keyboard with the notes on, a B sharp, there is no black note between B and C, B sharp is basically a C, yeah, just by any other name, one semitone above, C sharp, C sharp major has seven sharps, now, that's it, that literally is all your key signatures in sharps, you just find the last sharp, up one semitone, that is your major key, now, Let's just quickly go through. I'm just going to go through and do a couple of these. I won't do many, but um, again, and this is here for you. Music theory exercises key sig. Now, I'll just drag this a load up probably on the wrong screen. Oh, it's right on the right screen. Now, oh, my web browser is outdated. Oh, well, it is because it's uh, that one. Okay. So, Simon? Yes. Is that the same for flats? Finding flat no. key signatures. No. I'll, do, I'll, do, I'll do sharps first and then we'll do okay. flats. Flats is Thank just you. as easy. Actually, flats is easier in my opinion. So, one second. Uh, key signatures. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. Now, this you can customize your thing so it will only give you the ones you want. So, here we go. Uh, yes. So, here's our first question. Now, your job is to follow what I just said. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sharps. We don't even need to read music because we just count. Father Charles goes down and ends battle. The last sharp is a B sharp. Okay? One semitone above a B sharp is a C sharp. So it is C sharp major. That's correct. Next one. How many sharps are there? One, two, three, four, five sharps. Father Charles goes down and the fifth sharp is A sharp. Even if you don't read music, you can still work this out. A sharp. One semitone above A sharp is a B. Therefore, the key signature is B major. Correct. Next one. Seven sharps. The more you do this, the more you'll remember. But let's just go through it. Father Charles goes down and ends battle. One semitone of a B sharp. A B sharp is a C. Is a C sharp. C sharp major. Two sharps. Father Charles. One semitone above a C sharp is 
A, D. It's D major. Now, you can go through that for as long as you like, but the same rule will never let you down. That one, four sharps, one semitone above the last sharp, a D sharp is an E. That's E major. The next one, that's five sharps, B major, because Father Charles goes down and, and one semitone above an A is a B, so it's B major. Seven again, C sharp, and the more you do this, the more you'll just get to know, okay? You'll just get to learn, and you'll just get to go, yeah, I'm fine, yeah? Six, we haven't done six yet. Father Charles goes down and ends. E sharp is an F. One semitone above an F is an F sharp, F sharp major. Okay, so that's the that's the first thing on that. Mike. So the uh, C sharp and F sharp are the only two options being given here for uh, um, scales starting on the sharp. Yes. Um, but like D sharp exists, I could start to scale on the D sharp. Yes, you could. Uh, but most of the time, if you add a piece of music in D sharp major, it is more likely that it would be written in E flat major uh, because it has less flats than you would have sharps. But oh, still... so that, that, that's when we'd get the flats. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So if you had D sharp major, you could write a piece of music in D sharp major, 100%. Um, but it would have loads and loads of sharps. And actually, it's exactly the same enharmonically as E flat major, whereas E flat major only would have two flats, whereas D, f D sharp major would have tons, tons and tons and tons of, flat, of sharps in it. So it's more likely you would find that piece of music in E flat major than D sharp. So the, the only sharp keys in major you would find normally are C sharp major with seven, F sharp major with uh, six sharps. But no, good question. That is that is that is true. Uh, but you very rarely would find other sharp keys. Uh, normally, they'd be flat keys. Um, so flat signatures. Find the penultimate flat. That is your major key. <laughs> you don't even have to count. Penultimate, the one before the last. That's why F major with one flat. There's only one flat, so there is no penultimate. Because there's only one. <laughs> That's the only reason you need to learn F, F, F major, because there's only one B flat. So, again, testing test time. So, flats, you only need, and I'll do flats now and we'll go through and I'll show you. You only need to find the penultimate, the one before last, that is always your key. So, we have four flats, okay? Battle, ends, and down. Take one away, battle, ends, and A flat. Four flats is A flat major. Battle, ends, and down. Take one off, we're back onto the A, it's A flat. That one has seven flats. Battle, ends, and down goes Charles's father. If we go one off, we're back on Charles's C, so it's C, uh, C flat, okay? C flat, C flat, okay? Next one, six, battle ends and down goes Charles's. What's before Charles's? Down goes Charles's G, G flat. Next one. Three flats, battle ends and take one off. We're back to the E flat, so it's E flat. Penultimate flat is your key. Oh, there's no flats there. What on earth could that be? C. That's the only one you need to learn. C. C has none. That one, six. What's our penultimate flat? It's our G flat. It's G flat major. And again, you could go on all day, but the same pattern goes through. It's given us C major again. No sharps and flats. We need to memorize that. I'm sorry, I couldn't find a way of making that one easy. But really, you just have to memorize that C major is none. The rest of it is all workoutable. Next question. So first things first. To work out a minor key, you always work out major first. Okay? Then you go down by three semitones. That is your minor key. 
work it out as major, count down by three. And I'm going to bring up a keyboard in a second. The only thing you will ever need to do, the most you'll ever need to do, is have a picture of a keyboard either in your brain or on a piece of paper or on your phone. Okay? That's all you'll ever need to do. You only ever go down by three semitones. Okay? And as we said earlier, if you see accidentals in the music, it might mean the piece is in a minor key. I'll say might because it doesn't always mean, because sometimes if you get something that jazzy, you might get kind of blue notes and jazz notes in there, and they might mean you have other accidentals in there. But often if you've, if you've got the same accidental in there and it keeps on popping up, it may well be that you're in a minor key. Now, let's just quickly, uh, I will just quickly show you. Now, on that website, which is musictheory.net, free website, by the way, the musictheory.net, if you go onto the thing that says tools, it will give you a pop-up piano. Tools, pop-up piano. It then gives you a pop-up piano. Not surprisingly, considering it called pop-up piano, it pops up a piano. Now I can therefore, and you can play it. How cute. However, the best thing is you can count down three semitones. So if therefore you're here and I said, okay, I'm in C major, no sharps and flats, what is my relative minor? I count down by three. Two, three. A. That's an A. Now, you might want to write that down on a piece of paper if you don't know the notes on a piano, but you can get pictures of a piano or the notes of a piano. E, and then you can work that out. So if I just click that, that's a G sharp. Let's call it a G sharp for the moment. So G sharp major. What is the, and G sharp major isn't one you use. You probably would actually use A flat major. Let's follow the rules properly and say it's A flat major. A flat major, go down by three. One, two, three. F minor is the relative minor of A flat major. Now, I haven't yet worked out in my head what those are. How would I work it out, though? Well... A flat. How would I work out how many flats are in the key of A flat? Add one flat to the rhyme. Okay? Battle, ends, and down. Four. So you can work my rhyme, my little tin thing out, not only to work out what a key signature is, but to work out how many flats or sharps a key signature has, a, P, a scale has. So if I, if I think, okay... I'm in A-flat major, how, what's, how many flats do I have in A-flat major? How am I supposed to work that one out? Well, you just follow it through. Remember, the penultimate is A-flat. Add one more flat in the correct order. Battle, ends, and down. A-flat major has four flats. And then you also can, once you've worked out the relative minor, you can also say that F minor has four flats because you've used that other rule. It's exactly the same with sharps. If I say, and someone said, yeah, we're in A major. We're in A major. Well, how many sharps does A major have then? Or how many flats does A major have? Right, well, okay, A major, what would you do? You go down by one semitone. Down by one semitone is G sharp. You then go, father, Charles, goes. Three. So A major has three sharps. Does that make sense? So you can use the set, you can, you can do that rhyme either way. You can either use it by looking at a piece of music and then working out what key signature that is. So three sharps is A major. Or you can go from A major, go down by one semitone for a G sharp, count up, Father Charles goes, and you'll know that A major has three sharps. So you can work it out either way. If you were keen, you want to know how many sharps or flats, G major. You go down by one semitone. F sharp is your first sharp, one sharp in G major. Okay? The flats is exactly the same. You just need to remember the penultimate flat is your key. So E flat major, battle, ends, and. You always go one further. That's if you want to know how many flats is in E flat major, if it's a named one. If you look at a piece of music and it's got three flats, battle, ends, and, you take off one. So you get your penultimate flat, and that is your key. E flat major has three flats. To work out a minor, go down by three. 
So those bits of information. Now, you might think, well, you could have saved me an hour and a half, mate, and you could have just told me that in 20 minutes, put it on a PowerPoint presentation, I could have saved myself an afternoon. Okay? However, if you don't understand where scales come from, to understand where something else comes from, it still is, it's, it's, myster it's making something mysterious that was n is not supposed to be mysterious, if that makes sense. Like, none of this stuff is mysterious. It's all logical. All music generally follows patterns and logical patterns, okay? It's why people say, people say, I don't always agree with it, music and maths are quite closely kind of linked. Again, I hate maths, though, and I love music, so I sometimes don't agree that music and maths are linked because I don't like maths. Um, I don't not like it, I'm just not very good at it, and I'm not interested in it. I think I don't like the mathematical part of music as much as the creative part. Uh, so I would say that music is related to music uh, more than it is to maths. Uh, but it, it is true that music is logical, it follows patterns, it follows rules, and in that way it is like math maths. Uh, the fact that chords and, and, and further things like the circle of fifths and chords and interrelationships and intervals, they're all based around mathematical principles which are based upon logic. There's, there's nothing haphazard about any of this. Major scales always follow the same pattern. Minor scales follow the same pattern. Uh, you know, harmonic minor always raises the seventh. Melodic raises six and seven on the way up but not on the way down. Yeah, there's quite a lot of rules, but they all have logic and reason behind them. And I don't want you to be thinking that you know, why don't we need to be sitting there wondering who, who came up with scales? Why is an octave an octave? Who decided that that was an octave? Who decided that, you know, you know where does that come from? Um, that was the questions I asked at school and I got told to shut up um, because my teacher didn't want to tell me those answers, probably because they didn't know themselves. But I just got very frustrated that I wasn't told the why. I was told the rule, but not where it came from. And I never liked that.